Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Mobile World Live webinar. I'm Diana Guvert, Mobile World Live's U.S. Editor, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this event. Today, we're going to delve into everything you need to know to get your FirstNet device to market. FirstNet, a nationwide public safety communications network for America's first responders, was created to provide emergency personnel with a dedicated network, high-speed mobile network, that is, and that network is currently being built by AT&T, which also carries FirstNet devices in its stores. This new network presents an enormous opportunity for device OEMs, but they also face significant challenges in meeting strict requirements and passing a rigorous vetting process to get devices certified for use on FirstNet. So today, we'll cover the steps in the FirstNet certification process, critical component selection, and how to ferry a product through design and certification to mass production. Here to walk us through it all is a great panel comprised of Scott Ellis, Director of Product Marketing and Carrier Relations at Tellit, Brandon Gallion, AT&T's Lead Product Marketing Manager for FirstNet Solutions, and Ken Bednaz, Tellit's VP of Application Engineering. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so before we get started, I'd like to encourage everyone to engage with us on this webinar by responding to the poll question, which will be appearing on your screen. I'd also like to encourage you all to post any comments and questions that you may have. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some time to answer those queries. You can submit questions in the webinar window by typing in the comment box underneath the slide. So with that, and with everyone answering our poll question, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Brandon and the panel to get things started. All right, thank you very much for having me on today. I'm uh, going to talk to you about uh, the FirstNet certification process. And, and just to give everybody a little overview, a uh, more in-depth overview of FirstNet. So FirstNet is an independent authority that was established by Congress um, and is responsible for the design, construction, deployment, and operation of the uh, National Public Safety Broadband Network, so more commonly called the FirstNet Network. Um, FirstNet, the FirstNet Government Authority selected AT&T as the provider tasked with building out um, and assuming all operational, financial, and re technical responsibilities associated with the network for up to 25 years. Um, so this private-public partnership is, um, you know, meant to service the needs of our first responders and those entities that help support our first responders. Um, because we're talking about first responders and how critical their communications um, are, it is definitely important that we, you know, we hold these devices that they're going to use to, a, you know, a high bar when it comes to certification. And just a, as a broad overview, any device that's going to be certified for use with the FirstNet network will have to have uh, FCC and um, uh, PTCRB certification, as well as undergone AT&T's device technical acceptance process and FirstNet's device approval process. So those first three items, FCC, PTCRB, and AT&T's um, uh, TA process, so those are all uh, ones that you're going to be doing directly as you get your devices certified. AT&T works with FirstNet um, for the device approval process for the FirstNet Authority. This is something that we really handle um, for you. It's not a separate engagement that you would need to have. Um, <clears throat> so talking about, uh, you know, building a device for FirstNet. What you see on the screen right now is a device questionnaire. This is something that when you are looking to onboard a device to AT&T's uh, TA process, uh, you're going to see a questionnaire like this. It's actually several pages long, but I've just highlighted the first page because I think it helps um, point out some critical questions that you should be thinking about when, when trying to design a, a device for a first net. So, you know, asking yourself, who am I really building this device for? Um, am I building this for a sworn law enforcement officer or a, a firefighter? Note that the two may have very different needs. You know, a firefighter, they're going to be more concerned with, uh, you know, gloved operation, uh, high temperature environments. Police officers, on the other hand, uh, you know, louder environments, things where um, being able to communicate and hear clearly, um, you know, ambulance uh, would have an e even different set of uh, criteria 
um, as well. So you can see that there's a number of questions on there that we're going to ask about, you know, who are you going to, uh, is intended for this device to be used with? Uh, what kind of features are you looking for? Is this really just going to be a basic uh, sensor type device or one that provides data connections? Or is it going to provide some kind of voice service or location service, um, some kind of messaging service? Uh, what, what kind of technical operations is this device going to have? Um, is it going to be a gateway, wireless communications versus you know, you're plugging in with a, a standard Ethernet uh, cord? So a lot of these things are some are you're going to be asked from AT&T, um, but the, I wanted to highlight it today because it helps you um, when you're thinking about how do I design my product, how do I you know target which which groups of FirstNet customers am I going to really you know is this going to be the best fit for? And note that there's going to be some overlap, you know. Uh, Police, fire, uh, ambulance, uh, all of those are going to use, you know, trunk mount and modems, ruggedized devices, but there may be some other devices that are really more specialty in nature <clears throat> and may not apply to all of these different user types. Um, so talking about your devices when you're starting to construct it, I want to point out that the easiest path by far for FirstNet certification is using an approved module. Um, so when you're using an approved module by a vendor like Tellit, um, Tellit's really done a lot of that work for you when it comes to that certification process. Um, it's a much easier path if you were to go that route. Um, we would encourage you to visit att.com forward slash modules for the list of all of our approved FirstNet modules. All you need to do is uh, look for the columns titled FirstNet and filter down with either FirstNet capable or FirstNet ready, FNC or FNR. Both of these module types are designed uh, and will work with the FirstNet network. Um, but note that the FirstNet Ready module is the ones that support Band 14. And I want to highlight Band 14 for a second because as part of that um, work by Congress to create the FirstNet Authority, what they also did was dedicated uh, 20 megahertz of spectrum called Band 14 and allocated it to the FirstNet Authority for use with the construction of uh, the, the public safety network. So Band 14 is going to be critical for FirstNet, it really is public safety spectrum. So I'd absolutely recommend if you're looking at developing a device using a FirstNet <clears throat> module, um, you should first and foremost look at a FirstNet ready module since that's going to uh, appeal to more uh, larger segment of the customer base. Now, if you are looking to <clears throat> go through without an approved module, so you have a chipset and you want to you know, develop your product on your own, absolutely supported. Um, just know that there are going to be more testing requirements. It's typically a longer development and testing cycle. And we have documents that will help you uh, through this process. So that's another thing um, good to point out is that at and we understand, especially if you're new to this, how um, you know, difficult and challenging this might be. We have vendor coordinators that are there to help you along the way to answer any questions that you may have and really guide you through that process. So when we talk about our devices uh, specific to FirstNet, um, note that we're, we're kind of trying to group this into two different categories. Number one is, um, you know, we're calling it public safety optimized. That name may change because this is kind of uh, early in, in that naming process. But um, these devices are the ones that are going to be used by public safety users and first responders. Um, so these devices are those that are going to have, you know, carry sensitive data um, to let FBI encryption levels. These devices <clears throat> are going to need, you know, maybe a little bit more requirements, a little bit more testing from a security perspective. We want to make sure that data is secure um, for our first responder community. The second category is really just, a, you know, more of a ready designation where it's not necessarily going to be um, used by these, uh, you know, first responders. Um, the data isn't as sensitive. Think like sensor data, you know, your traditional IoT, um, you know, small packets. They're just sending that location data, your telemetry data, things like that. So uh, with those devices, they may not have to go through uh, these security tests. This this chart right here may be a little intimidating. I'm going to try to guide you through this. 
Um, so we have a few terms on the left, uh, our device type, NR, NO. That's network ready or net network optimized. The majority of devices we see are network ready. Um, network ready are devices that vendors and, and OEMs such as yourself are looking to get certified for use on FirstNet. Um, but they're going to be sold, you know, uh, either directly or through, you know, the, your own sales teams, things like that. Um, network Optimize is a device where it's going to be sold by AT&T. So these we commonly refer to as a stock device. They're going to be wind up in retail stores and channels like that. So typically, uh, you know, for what we're talking about, it's more going to be a network-ready device. Um, then you have a path art. Is it going to be an approved module or an unapproved module? So I, how I said earlier, the approved module is the easiest path. Note that you have a lot less requirements. You don't have to go through AVL, extensive radio testing for AT&T if you're using this approved module. Um, you don't have to do the field testing uh, if you're using an approved module, unlike if you were using an unapproved module. Yes, you have to do the AVL testing. You have to do the AT&T radio. You have to do the field testing. Um, so it is a, a higher bar. And then, <clears throat> then we have that public safety ready or public safety optimized I talked about in the previous slide. Um, so this is kind of help you through. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going with a network, let's use the first line, you're going with a network ready, approved module, uh, public safety ready device. Uh, so this is a device that's, think your IoT sensor, it's not going to handle sensitive data. You can see that there's a handful of requirements that you would need to meet. Again, the majority of it has been done by the module itself. And then if you look at the second line where it's an approved module, um, but it's optimized, you see that there's this uh, extra security requirement. And that's just a few extra security tests. We want to make sure the data is secure. So kind of giving you a, a broad uh, view of the process. Um, number one, the first thing you're going to do is complete that FirstNet questionnaire. Um, that's the document uh, that I shared on one of the first screens. Uh, you're going to onboard your certification request. You know, let us know that you want to go ahead and get your device certified. Uh, the link is is here, um, and then we can also, um, if you go to that att.com uh, forward slash module site, att.com forward slash onboarding, it's all there's all links there for that as well. Um, you're going to be expected to send two samples of your devices to the AT&T labs for, test, uh, for testing purposes. Um, there would be an ex uh, you would also work with a uh, lab for an external lab for execution of some other test cases. Um, you're going to complete all the items that are found at att.com forward slash GNR. That's get network ready. So. Um, those items include that PTCRB certification I talked about earlier, um, making sure that the antenna that you're using is AT&T certified. Um, you're going to choose and implement your device identification method. Um, you're going to complete some trending, trendy testing that includes the FirstNet SIM. Trendy is a, a testing where uh, we're going to send you a handful of SIMs. You're going to turn the device on insert the SIMs, and then you're going to, you know, run a few tests that we specify for you. So it's a, a very easy, simple test process for you. Um, if you have a FirstNet optimized device, uh, you would complete that extra security validation. Um, and then if you were to specify that you were going to use, you know, a specific FirstNet feature such as mission critical, we would test and validate those applications. Upon completion of testing, uh, we're going to issue two types of TA letters for FirstNet certification. The first is a AT&T technical acceptance letter. Um, this will be a, uh, awarded to really any device that we certify at AT&T. It's going to have specific boxes that are checked to say what you know what you are compliance with, with what your device is in compliance with. And then the second letter we're going to issue is a FirstNet technical acceptance letter. Um, this is in addition to the AT&T TA letter, and it's really the, the document that we use with the FirstNet authority through their device, device approval process. Um, and this is what really will ensure that your device gets on the NIST list of certified devices for use with FirstNet. And at that point, I'm going to hand off to Scott from Tellit to walk you through the next uh, 
talking about modules for first responder devices. Thanks, Brandon. Scott Ellis with Telewireless here. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the devices that we've already uh, approved for use on FirstNet, uh, some of the use cases, and then I'll pass it to Ken for a little more detail in device selection. So uh, typical FirstNet application devices requiring certification are essentially all of them, right? And as everyone is probably aware by now, IoT applications come in every shape and size that you can imagine, and many that we haven't even dreamed up yet. Uh, Telus' unique status as a pure IoT company offers customers the benefits of IoT modules and connectivity and platforms all in one roof, under one roof. Uh, we've got over 15 years of IoT expertise, along with uh, resources and support focused on the success of our customers. We offer uh, the ability to help our customers go from an idea or concept for a solution all the way to full-scale commercial deployment. Uh, we can now make use of all this expertise uh, for solutions designed for the FirstNet network. So we've got a couple different form factors that we've already approved for use with FirstNet. Uh, all of these are industrial grade modules that uh, offer 4G LTE, 3GPP compliance. Again, they're all pre-certified, ruggedized, and, and ready to use. Uh, we've got a high category mini PCIe data card uh, that's pictured here, the LM960. These kind of uh, devices offer a standard interface that can be quickly designed into solutions for things like mobile computing, routers, video applications, drones, just any kind of solution that requires a high bandwidth or high data throughput. Uh, we also offer LGA form factor, pictured on the left. Uh, the example here is the LE910. These products are compatible with previous generations of the 910 series, so for anybody that's uh, used TELID in the past, we can move quickly into a design using these approved devices uh, these are perfect for things like uh, purpose-built solutions for asset monitoring, people tracking, asset control, all of these uh, types of solutions that can be used on the FirstNet network. A little more detail uh, about LM960. So it's a Category 18 uh, product, the newest and highest category available. Uh, this one's built on the Qualcomm X20 chipset. It offers up to 1.2 gigabit downlink and 150 megabit uplink. Uh, so this is the kind of device that you'd use uh, where you'd want to support, you know, as I already stated, high bandwidth. Uh, this is capable of doing multiple things at one time with all of that data throughput. So think about this in a, a router that goes into an emergency vehicle, um, you can pass massive amounts of data at the same time for you know, video solutions, shared computing, uh, Wi-Fi can be built in. Um, this is fully photo capable, uh, capable also of connecting to cloud services like AWS and Azure. And of course, it's uh, 4G LTE as well as 3G. LGA form factor devices, uh, like the LE910, uh, offer compact design, as you can see, 28 by 28 millimeter, uh, so very small and, and easily built into uh, personalized devices or specific devices that are specific for a single application. Uh, again, 4G LTE. This device is a Cat1 grade, uh, capable of 10 megabit down and five up, um, also has 3G, has uh, Volte support, so voice applications can be used with this. Uh, we also offer app zone support, so applications can be loaded directly onto the module or pieces of applications. Um, still capable of uh, connectivity to the cloud services, photo, fully certified, all that fun stuff. Um, we also offer a CAT4 product with, with the same design uh, that has all of these same features, but uh, goes up to 150 megabits uh, downlink speed and 50 megabits up. So, 
enough uh, about the specific products, I'll hand it over to Ken to talk about how to select the right component for your solution. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ken Bednaz. I'm the Vice President of Application Engineering for Telet. And my team really has two main roles. Um, we are responsible for the module certification with the network operators like AT&T and FirstNet. And then we're also responsible for working with all our partners to helping them successfully designing a product and helping them get through certification. And I think if we recap the first two sections of today's webinar, Brandon did a great job uh, explaining the AT&T and FirstNet process. And when you take a look at it, that's a, it's actually a very straightforward process, very organized, and goes very quickly. What I'm going to focus on today is a little bit how do we get to that point? You know, how do we get to the point where we can get into the easier part of the process, which is the AT&T and FirstNet part of it? And there's a lot of building blocks that we have to do successfully to get to that point. Because if we don't do that, we're not going to get to the AT&T FirstNet process, and we're not going to get to market. So I'm going to focus on that. Uh, second part of the presentation today by Scott Ellis really focused around the different products that are available. You know, there's a wide range of products depending on what your application needs are and what your application will be doing. And so I'm going to jump ahead to the next slide here and talk a little bit about you know, what it takes. Right? When, it, when we talk about a cellular module and bringing a cellular product to market, it's much different than some of the other wireless technologies. I know a lot of people are familiar with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Um, these other short-range technologies where you actually own the network. You know, you can use a network however you want. Performance is not really uh, 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 a limitation. You know, as long as the Wi-Fi signal is good enough for you, it's okay. When it comes to cellular, it's a completely different story. There's specific uh, requirements that we need to make in the industry to make sure the cell towers work. Cell towers are fixed location, fixed antennas. Um, so we have to make sure that certain types of performances, especially RF performance, is good enough to get onto those networks. And so when we talk about selecting modules or selecting kind of the core cellular part or wireless part of your design, there's a lot of things that go into it. It's, it's not just selecting a component and running forward. You have to really step back and take a look at all the different options and, and, and steps in the process to make sure that you can set yourself up for success. You don't design first and think about certification second. What you have to do is you actually have to take the requirements in, think about certification first, and then go through a product selection product design cycle. And so here at Tell, we try to support our partners and work with our network operator partners very closely from beginning to end. And so we talk about everything, you know, we talk about program management, uh, technical background, um, certification background. What we do in my team is we help everything from pre-sales to after sales. And so we work with our partners, we will give technology overviews. You know, what is the right technology for you? Is cellular right or is another technology a better choice? Uh, we'll talk about the features and specifications of the product. Do you need voice? Do you not need voice? Do you need high data rates, low data rates? And then we'll help walk you through a product selection phase. And so the first thing we want to do is kind of select the right product that's going to meet your needs. And then we jump into the design aspect of it. Okay? And so before we can start designing, we need to really understand the requirements from the network operator perspective. And I think Brandon did a great job laying those out. And so we know if we're going to design for AT&T FirstNet, we know exactly what we need to achieve. There's no hidden surprises. And so as we get into the design phase, what my team does uh, in, in our field application engineering team is we will work with your design house, design teams to help support your design integration by doing you know, design reviews, so that's schematic and Gerber file reviews, um, helping with hardware questions about you know, RF trace routing, antenna placement types of antennas, and then everything from the software driver side make sure that you can communicate with the cellular modem and have it do the voice calls or the data connections or the text messaging or whatever it may be. Um, and after the design, is, design in, um, section is completed, we move on to certification. And like Brandon said, there's kind of three aspects of it. There's the regulatory, which is more of like the FCC, FCC which is uh, mandatory by the government. There's also the industry approvals, which is PTCRB that's used in North America. And that's where I'm going to focus a lot of my time today is on that second step with PTCRB. And then the third step, which Brandon covered very well, which is the AT&T first net approval process. 
And then after that, there's always going into the after-sales support if there's any field issues or other issues you encounter to make sure that you have a team standing behind you to make sure you can solve those in a timely manner. So when you work with Tellit, you engage a, a wide range of expertise when it comes to cellular. It helps you everything from pre-sales all the way to after-sales. Now, as far as selecting the right module, Scott went through a, a few different products we have that do support Band 14, so everything from embedded modules uh, to data cards. And so part of the product selection is really about, you know, um, you know, you know which MNOs you need to support. Is this going to be uh, a U.S. deployment on FirstNet? Is there any other requirements for Canada, for Mexico, for Latin America, for APAC, for EMEA, for other regions of the world? Um, and do you want Band 14 support? You know, Brandon, I think made it very clear that there's a lot of advantages about Band 14. Uh, it's dedicated spectrum for public safety. Um, here at Tell, we made a big commitment to Band 14. We have um, four products uh, with Band 14 support um, and, and building more for the future. So definitely all in on Band 14. Um, then it comes to the technology options. You know, what type of device are you trying to design? Is it data only? Do you need voice support? And how about location support? I think location and public safety is extremely important. And so do you have the GPS, you know, the assisted GPS support that you need to get very accurate position location in very short times or very impaired uh, locations, whether you're, you know, in a building, in a parking garage. And so Tell brings together some cellular technology with location technology to allow you to get those locations in very difficult, uh, difficult environments. Um, also, on the data speed front, you know, what, what does the whole business plan look like for the device? You know, are you going to need a lot of data per month or a little data? And that helps you determine what type of product you need. Are you going to be pushing a lot of data fast, or can that data be filtered in over time? Is it real-time data? Is it, is it data from drones, cameras, videos where you need high bandwidth? Or is it a sensor that's collecting data over, over a, a month or a year, then sending that data in periodically? And then as far as form factors, there's, uh, there, there's options on form factors. There's more embedded, um, like Scott was talking about, with our LE910, and there's more of the data cards, which are more a plug-and-play type of solution. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is how do you design an embedded module with keeping in mind, you know, the certification requirements that we have to pass in order to get to market. You know, unfortunately, in this industry, we see a lot of designs that start and never get to market. You know, they may... They may never get to market because they never think about what the antenna requirements are. So they think, hey, we can put, make something really small. We're going to make it so small that the antenna doesn't fit and our antenna doesn't have enough efficiency to get their certification. So I'm going to touch on some of those topics today. So the embedded module, I think um, the main purpose here is people pick up an embedded module and get very uh, overwhelmed, right? You see this, this component. What is this component? What are all these pads or pins on the back of it? And so I want to try to simplify that. Um, you know, if you're an electronic designer, you've seen this before, and it's actually pretty straightforward. But what we're doing with our cellular modules, they're basically cell phones with no keypad and display. So here's, here's a core component that will work over the first net network that can get you voice, that gets you data, text messaging. So you have different bearers to use and choose from depending on what you're going to do in your use case. But as you flip over that module, you see these pads, and actually, there's, there's very few of these pads that are actually being used, and it's pretty straightforward. And so, you know, we have design guidelines which really lay out the different pins and what they're used, used for. Um, so we have everything from on-off circuitry. Uh, we have a USB and UART pins that help communicate with the product itself. You have uh, connections for battery, antenna, uh, SIM connections, or UICC connections. So again, Pretty straightforward, but I just want to give you an idea. When you flip over and you see 144 connections, you're like, oh, my God, do I need to connect all these? You don't. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and that's what my team does, is work with you to make sure we can optimize your design and get you to market very successfully. So this is backing out one higher level. So this is a block diagram of a device or an application. So this is kind of taking those pins and putting them in different blocks. And what becomes really important in the design um, are these different blocks? Because these different blocks, if they're not done correctly, can prevent you or interfere you from getting the market. They can prevent, um, you know, the RF performance from being good enough to get to market. 
uh, that can prevent, uh, um, that could be causing noise. The antenna may not radiate, uh, you know, well enough so you can't reach the cell tower. And so we're going to touch on some of these, um, everything from antennas. I think antenna is, is a very, um, very important uh, selection point that, you know, cannot be underestimated. And you can't get into your product design without knowing your antenna requirements. And so I work with somebody like Telet. We take the, the first net at t requirements. We back out um, the Telet, you know, conducted output power, and then we help create antenna efficiency requirements for your designers. So we don't guess when we're doing a design together. We actually know exactly what we need to meet in order to get to market. Um, the other important one is power supply. Power supply can be a source of noise at times, which could cause uh, emission levels to get too high. And so there's different types of power supplies. There's... Um, there's LDOs, there's switching power supplies, and so we help guide you in that aspect and everything with the SIM, the UICC SIM connections, which again, it seems very simple, um, but we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen people where they're not following the guidelines and they get in trouble when they go through certifications. So again, pretty straightforward if we work together. If you kind of jump into it uh, on your own, then, uh, you know, there's always some risk associated with it, and then there's some optional connections for, you know, audio connections are optional depending if you need a voice or not, and then some general purpose IOs and analog to digital converters and, and some other components. So Brandon touched on the value of a pre-certified module, and I want, to, I want to touch on that a little bit more. Um, the advantage of using a pre-certified module, um, there's a couple of main ones. I pointed out four here. It really helps lower your risk. It lowers your risk because uh, the RF design is optimized. Um, it's already pre-certified. When I, when I say pre-certified, I'm talking tremendous amounts of certification efforts that, that TELIT does um, to, to get through some of these approval processes. We'll, we'll talk about that. So it definitely lowers your risk in getting the market um, faster time to market. Uh, since we're selling you all the RF components that are optimized for cellular and pre-certified, uh, your first spin of your PCB will probably be your last. And when we talk about time to market, um, using an embedded or mini PCAE module that's pre-certified from Telet, you can get to market in six months. If you're going to do a chip down design, you're probably talking 18 months. And so Telet spends around 12 months at least ahead of time designing our products, taking them through the certification process. So you can eliminate almost a year out of your design cycle by using a pre-certified module. Um, so we tell you know, people really interested in chipset designs, we say, hey, go ahead, start with the module, do a module design, and Consider chipset in your second or third generation product if that's important to you. But if you're going to start with a chipset design, you're not going to get to market for a long time. You're not going to know if your business case makes sense. And, and a lot of times that you know, really stops people and never get those cool products to market. Um, lower uh, design investment. Um, so typically we say with a chipset design, you're going to have to spend around 2 to $3 million of R&D of, uh, investment. When you talk about an embedded module, it's closer to two or three hundred thousand dollars. So it really uh, simplifies and reduces how much investment you need to make as a company to bring a first net product to market. And when you say, "Hey, you know, I'd rather spend two, three hundred thousand dollars," that sounds a lot better than two to three million dollars of doing a ground-up design and, and a huge staff that you have to employ for many, many years. Um, and then lower certification costs. And I think this is the big one. This, this time to market is huge, but also certification costs. Uh, when Telep brings a product to market, Brandon talked about the different steps from FCC, PTCRB, um, and then the at t first net. You know, we're spending $500,000 million to bring a cellular module to market um, because we're testing every layer of that module. We're testing everything, every RF component on the module, every frequency band, every channel, um, all the RF protocols, making sure the interoperability with the network is working perfectly. Um, when you jump into a pre-certified module that's pre-tested and pre-certified, it, it lowers that investment closer to maybe $50,000. And so now instead of testing the protocols and every aspect of the RF chain, you're simply focused on the additional components that you're adding. So if I back it up a slide, when we talk about certification, we're really going to be focused – hold on, I'm going to show you this slide back one. Okay. There we go. So when we're talking about certification now, we're not touching the actual module itself. When you do an end product certification using pre-certified module, you're only testing the antenna aspect of it and really the power supply and SIM connection. So you're, uh, you're, you're really only focused on the additional components that you're adding to the module. So 
uh, it really lowers the risk, lowers the investment, lowers you know lowers the time, uh, reduces the time in the market. So definitely um, definitely worth using um, a pre-certified module. And and Brandon gave you that list where you can find all the different pre-certified modules. And today we want to focus on certification, right? It's, it's how do we get people to market? How do we get the cool designs onto that first net network? Um, it's all about certification and really that second step. When it comes to, uh, you know, I laid the three steps here. The regulatory certification, which is really FCC ID, FCC I should say, that's really focused on radiated emissions, part 15, which is unintentional radiator. Very straightforward test. Um, uh, not, not too many challenges there. So pretty straightforward. It's tested in anechoic chambers. That's the top picture I have is, is showing some FCC Part 15 testing being completed. Um, the big risk is really in the second step, which is the industry certification or PTCRB. PTCRB is really going to be uh, the most difficult part of it, and it's going to test those three areas. It's going to test the UIC, UICC SIM card. So it's going to make sure that even though it's just five connections, that your capacitor values, that your connections are right, making sure the clocks can run. Um, and so it's very straightforward design. But you know, once in a while we see uh, somebody go to a contract manufacturer and they start, you know, substituting in uh, resistors and capacitors. And uh, the, the UICC lines are sensitive enough where they need to be within a certain tolerance. So it's really important to understand. So we'd help work with your factory to make sure that they're only allowed to substitute components to certain levels, certain tolerances. Um, the second one is the radiate emissions part. And radiate emissions is where you actually turn on the transmitter. So we'll turn on different tra the transmitter for the different frequency bands and making sure that you stay within the limits. And so I'm just showing a picture there of how they measure the, the carrier frequencies and harmonics. And so this, is, uh, this, this can be a, a challenge in, in some aspects. And this will help make sure you have a ruggedized power supply. Make sure you don't have other components that are re-radiating or interfering, interfering like uh, displays um, or uh, other microprocessors. And so what we do at TELIT is we'll work with you to help do pre-certification because we want that certification with PTCRB to go as smooth as possible. So it's really working on it during the design aspects and doing pre-certification testing. And that's something that TELIT can do for you and, and work with you on. And then the third aspect of it is really antenna performance. And so they do this OTA testing, which they call TRP and TIS. You'll hear this term a lot. TIP is total radiated power, and TIS is total isotropic sensitivity. And so they'll go ahead and test your antenna performance to make sure that it's good enough that when you're between these cell towers or in a fringe area that you will have coverage. And so the antenna performance is a really huge aspect about bringing cellular market, which is very different than the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or other technologies. And so um, TRP is really only related to the antenna efficiency. So it's basically taking the output power of the tele radio, the antenna efficiency, and that will give you your TRP number. And they'll actually measure that in the lab in a 3D anechoic chamber. And same thing with TIS. So TIS is going to take into account the sensitivity, the conductive sensitivity of the module, uh, the noise factors in the module, and the hardware design of the application. Um, and the antenna efficiency. It's a little bit more complicated. And so what we do at Talit is we try to provide as much RF margin as possible. So not all cellular modules are created equal, right? They may look equal on specification sheets, but when you take a look at who's getting products to market, how much RF, RF margin you have, because all the RF margin is really important as you do these complex designs. And so we have a pretty good uh, proven track record of getting customers to market because you have large RF margins, which allow us to do a lot of cool designs. And then the third aspect is really the network operator certifications with AT&T and FirstNet, which are already covered today. So kind of a uh, quick summary. Um, you know, getting your product to market, there's a lot of steps. It, it can seem over, overwhelming, but it's really, it's really not. The, you know, these are steps that tell it. And first, it'll help guide you through. It's really, you know, mo module par par partner selection, uh, product selection, or, or module selection. Um, you know, device requirements and, and operator carrier requirements, designing, pre-certification, official certification, factory, lifecycle management. You know, and, and all these t traditional steps that you see with any kind of uh, electronic device design. But I really want to focus uh, just a couple of minutes on three main steps. One is, is, is the partner selection. I think partner selection is so important. 
especially with cellular, and I'm going to try to explain why it's really important with cellular. Um, you need to select a partner that's going to be with you during the design cycle. You know, so you have to make sure you select somebody that's going to uh, provide low risk to you, right? To get you to market, that's going to be by your side, doing the design reviews, design reviews doing the pre-certification testing. Um, people that have a roadmap, right? The roadmap of products, so you're not doing the design one time. So I think that's probably the most important part is how do you select a partner that you can trust and work with over many years to come. And then kind of jumping down to the last two, which are really important, which is lifecycle management. When we talk about AT&T, FirstNet, PTCRB, these are uh, uh, networks, uh, industry working groups that are working with 3GPP specifications, which is always evolving, right? We went from release 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 to 14, always adding new requirements, new feature sets. Um, same thing on the network operator side or PTCRB side, which are testing to these requirements. Every three months, every four months, every, it's every three months with PTCRB, there's new test cases, there's new requirements. And so that means that once TELET certified, our work doesn't stop. We have to keep the development team on staff, continuing to develop to the new requirements, to the new test limits. So we're always developing and keeping up with the latest requirements and specifications. And same thing on the network operator side. You know, you have AT&T and FirstNet releasing new requirements documents every four months, which is three times a year. And so again, we work very closely um, we, you know, with both the industries and the operators to make sure that we're always meeting the requirements, that you, we don't get stuck, that TELET doesn't get stuck, that our partners don't get stuck. And we would get stuck if we stopped development. If we, if we brought a product to market and just stopped, we would all get stuck, and, and we don't do that. And so the lifecycle management is really important with software and compliance, um, supporting you know, firmware over the air, updates like Scott Ellis mentioned, and, and device management is extremely important in the industry we live in with cellular. And so what Telet does is really help create a solution that can be updated over time. We don't want any products getting stuck in the field, not complying to the latest specifications. So we have a big focus and work with our partners to make sure we set up a scalable firmware over the air updating, device management updating, you know, algorithms that are secure and robust and can scale over time. And then the last one is really around next generation products, you know. Um, the beauty about working with Telet is we have the same form factor like the 910, the LE910 that we've been promoting for many years now. And so it allows you to do that hardware design, that software design one time and scale it. And so I mentioned earlier, if you're going to use an embedded module, you better have two to $300,000 to do that design because really it's going to be about one man year of RF or a hardware design and you know one or two man years potentially of AT software driver design, you know, just to give you an idea. Um, it's going to take some time to get that product to market. Six months of development by a couple of engineers. So there's an investment that you're making. But you don't want to keep making that investment year after year after year every time you do a new product. And so what Telet brings to market, and one of our main values is our 910 family and mini PCA families. We have a lot of different products. And so you don't have to keep reinvesting and redesigning. You can do plug and play. So if you take the LE910 products for the first net network and you need to bring a similar product over to, to Europe or APAC, we have sister products that will plug in. So you can use that same layout, that same footprint. You just take a different LE910 module designed for a different uh, region in the world and place that down. Same thing with the mini PC card. So we're trying to allow you to scale your business. So our value is not only with helping you get to market, but then giving you options to touch all the different corners of the globe with the different technologies and different bands supporting and different, different regions supporting different certifications. And so, um, again, uh, it's not to scare you, but it's to say, hey, select a good partner. Let's work together and get, get products to market. I know Telet already has uh, a bunch of products that have been FirstNet approved. We're having very uh, good success getting our partners through that process. So uh, we look forward to working with you. So I, I'll leave it at that and uh, hand it back over. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. It looks like we uh, concluded our presentation part of the webinar. So now let's go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion. Uh, we have a ton of questions coming in, and we are going to get started. But there is still time to ask questions if you have them. Remember, you can do so by typing into the comment box beneath the presentation window to submit them. So with that, we are going to go ahead and jump on our first question. And feel free to jump in here, guys. Um, so in a previous web webinar, FirstNet representatives mentioned that organizations like utilities, emergency repair crews, et cetera, can use FirstNet. 
Are there any other segments or applications um, for de device and solution makers to consider for certification? Hi, this is Brandon. I'll, I'll be happy to answer this. So yes, um, <clears throat> the FirstNet network is built for our first responders and those uh, entities that support first responders. So the easiest way I like to explain this is that if you pick up the phone and call 911, you're going to um, you know, reach a 911 dispatcher. That's a FirstNet primary customer. They're going to communicate to another uh, primary customer, such as a police department. Uh, let's say it's a traffic accident. Uh, police department's going to go out. They're going to call in someone for help. They might call a transportation department to shut down the roadway, um, then come and clean up the vehicles after the accident, you know, to get everybody, get the roads opened up again. Um, so in this scenario, we have our first responders that's supported by FirstNet. We also have uh, this extended primary group, which is those entities that a first responder calls on for support. So this can be any number of organizations. It could be public. It could be private. Um, you could have, you know, uh, utilities, transportation, um, you know, hazmat cleanup, you know, any types of organizations where a, a first responder is going to need to call on them for assistance in dealing with an, an emergency or the aftermath of an emergency um, would be supported by FirstNet. So, um, if you are a customer that's interested in FirstNet, if you want to get more information, I would encourage you to visit www.firstnet.com and just click Contact Us, and feel free to ask your question, and um, someone will get back to you. Great. Uh, so with that, we are going to move on to our next question. Um, and I think you may have touched on this, um, but maybe you can perhaps expand. Uh, how long does it typically take for a device to go from design to production uh, in terms of getting a FirstNet certified? I can, this is Ken Bednance from Talent. I can start from the design aspect of it. I mean, typically what we do is we'll work with customers and, and, and take a few weeks to kind of do a general architecture, uh, do a few weeks of a schematic and Gerber file board layout and then uh, get into the build and, and pre-certification testing. But typically start to finish is about six months. Great. Um, so I just want to go ahead and move on to another question here. Uh, and this one is kind of interesting. Uh, what happens if a de device doesn't receive certification the first time it's tested? Uh, this is Ken Bednitz from Tellet. Um, it depends what you know what where you're getting stuck. You know, we we see sometimes uh, a design that's maybe very compact in size may get stuck during the PTCRB process. That's the biggest risk area, and so that may mean you know uh, an antenna spin or change of the plastics to support a larger antenna, or it could be you know adding some capacitors to help reduce emissions or or harmonics. Um, so typically, if a product's going to get stuck, it's going to get stuck during that PTCRB approval process where the most rigorous testing is happening with regards to RF. Okay. Um, and we have yet another question that's come in. Um, so what kinds of devices are best suited to this network? I mean, what kind of use cases are you trying to serve? We know it's for first responders uh, and emergency personnel, but can you give us some examples maybe? Sure. So this is Brandon. I will uh, I will do my best to answer this. So um, it, it's a very wide variety, and uh, I know that's kind of a loaded answer. I'm going to try to elaborate a little bit more. Um, think about uh, you know a lot of your everyday devices that are used, your typical smartphones, your typical you know voice only devices. They're going to be used by FirstNet customers. Uh, Date only devices, USB modems, MiFi devices, rugged trunk mounted modems. Those are the examples of devices that are going to be used by first responders. Also think about you know your sensors, your um, anything from a you know a body vest, uh, you know. Um, Bulletproof vest, you know, the, the body armor sensors, uh, hit detection. Those are some ideas that the people are coming up with uh, for firefighters, heads-up displays, um, so that, you know, that big mask that they wear now, the ability to have, uh, you know, a, a thermal camera that gets broadcasted via a wireless radio back to 
um, you know, the command uh, post either, you know, at the department or, or in a vehicle outside. These are all examples of what can be used with FirstNet. And when you start talking about sensors, you're talking about any number of things, you know, uh, seismic, earthquake detection, uh, hazmat. Um, you know, gas, uh, you know, environmental sensors, all of these are used to provide situational awareness for the first responder. Um, so the, the ability for that first responder to, to know about the event before they arrive on scene. A lot of what happens now, now and, and in the past is that, um, you know, it's relayed via voice, you know, who's ever calling 911. Um, that information is, you know, relayed to the first responder en route. Um, but it's, it's very limited. But the ability for a first responder to actually see what's going on um, via video feed or, you know, see all the sensor data, you know, fire department, knowing what the temperature is like, uh, you know, how big the fire is spreading, how rapidly it's spreading. Is the weather going to, you know, think about the wildfires. If the wind's picking up, it's very dry. How quickly is that fire going to spread? Where do I need to mobilize to? So all of this kind of data is is you know, relevant for FirstNet. It's, these are kind of use cases that are supported for FirstNet. And it's really all about enhancing that uh, situational awareness for first responders and helping them to communicate. Great. Uh, we are going to keep moving here, and we still have questions pouring in, and we're going to get to as many as we can right now. Um, so here's an interesting one. Um, the focus of the presentation seemed to be on cellular, but Bluetooth and Wi-Fi were also mentioned. Uh, do you see use cases for VSAT and using a mix in the same device for backup? And would certification for such a thing be different? All right, so uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, take a stab at this one as well. Uh, I would say yes. Um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi are, are absolutely going to be, you know, critical proponents for. Uh, first responder. Uh, they may not be FirstNet solutions in and of themselves. I will say that, you know, with FirstNet, uh, AT&T has uh, 20,000 different Wi-Fi hotspots. So we have commercial Wi-Fi hotspots. First responders are eligible to use any of those uh, AT&T Wi-Fi wi hotspots at no additional charge. That can be useful for, like, offloading your data. Um, for things like Bluetooth, yes, uh, you know, it might make more sense that if I'm already carrying a smartphone, if I'm already carrying a data-only device and I can just tether my, you know, a wearable or something to my smartphone, um, you know, via Bluetooth, well, obviously, you know, that, that might be easier for me, um, maybe more cost-effective for me. So, so uh, you know, of course, Bluetooth is going to be supported. Um, now, VSET, I... Um, I know that there are, uh, you know, part of the FirstNet solution is a satellite component. Um, so we, we did partner um, for, for satellite service. So if a first responder goes outside of the traditional terrestrial coverage area, um, they're in a remote location, there is optional satellite service. You can have a BGAN that's on your car, um, you know, that, that lets you connect to the satellite service and still have that connectivity even when you're completely off the grid. Great. Thanks for taking a stab at that one. I appreciate it. Um, and then we have another one. Uh, can you clarify what types of devices will be classified as public safety optimized and therefore require additional security testing? Uh, so this is one that I, I don't have a list of devices. I can say, yes, this device will definitely um, require additional security testing. That questionnaire that we brought up right at the, you know, the first or second slide I went through, that's going to really help to find, um, you know, who's using this device, what's the use case for it, what's the purpose of this device. Um, that will help us determine what kind of traffic, you know, it, it's going to be subject to. So really... Um, knowing who's using the device and what it's going to be used for. If you're, you know, if you're trying to develop a device that's going to be used by the FBI for use in surveillance um, or homeland security, that device needs more security um, than than a device that's just performing, you know, air temperature or road temperature um, data to a first responder. So I hope that helped it helps uh, answer that question. Okay. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more here. Um, here's another. 
uh, with people tracking indoors, how will this work via cellular and 4G LTE where there is no GPS, BLE, or beaconing? Yes, uh, this is Ken Ben is. I can take that. So when it comes to location technologies, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, it's very true that for standalone GPS, uh, you know, outdoors is going to work a lot better compared to indoors. But um, AT&T FirstNet and Teledyne, we have assisted GPS technologies that take into account even partial satellite information, uh, cell location information, and we can calculate very accurately your indoor location. Um, and then we also have uh, areas where there's no cellular coverage at all, we can calculate location, or I should say no GPS coverage, we can calculate location via cell ID and, and cell triangulation. So uh, TELIT uh, alone has some technologies which we call IoT Locate, and then uh, TELIT and AT&T FirstNet have a, a great options for assisted GPS. So there's, there's a, a variety of different location options that we make available with our FirstNet modules. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys can speak to this one, but do you have any idea when SideLink LTE Direct D2D technology might be implemented for FirstNet? I I think that question would probably be best answered by AT&T, but I, I'm honestly I'm not sure of the answer to that one. Um, it's something, if you want to contact us at firstnet.com um, and use the contact us link, we can probably get you uh, an answer if it's at least on the roadmap. Okay. Then we will uh, leave that one to be answered offline. And uh, time, um, that's all the time we have for now. So we're going to go ahead um, and wrap things up here. Thank you, Scott, Brandon, and Ken for sharing your knowledge. And to our audience for tuning in and engaging with us, you asked some really great questions, and we are happy to have had you here with us. Uh, we will be making a replay available very shortly, so you'll have a chance to catch up in case you missed any of the content or slides. So thank you again to everyone for participating, and we will see you again very soon. Have a great week.